There are some people who say that the Christian faith is too soft, too sentimental, too much about love for that neighbor, too much about forgiveness and compassion. They would suggest that we live in a tougher world than that, a more rugged world, a more society that, that honors winners, not whiners, and we come off as whiners. Turning the other cheek, they would say, only creates both cheeks getting hit. That being nice to strangers is unwise and many times dangerous. That being vulnerable to others is foolish. Singing kumbaya is for losers. And old folks have become too soft in their sentimentality about this Jesus journey. They would say we need a more robust religion. <clears throat> in fact, we need a more manly Jesus. Someone who could stand up and fight back instead of all that lovey-dovey, sweet by-and-by stuff. You heard that? I've heard that. Well, if we're looking for a challenge, <clears throat> a religious challenge, a faith challenge, something that would test our mettle, I would suggest that we take seriously what I just read from Paul's letter to the Corinthians when he's talking in this letter of encouragement about the Jesus way. Paul said in that letter, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Has given us the ministry of reconciliation. The word reconcile comes from the Latin word conciliatus. It means to call or bring together, to win over, to soothe the anger, to make friendly, and to placate. The ministry of reconciliation, then, is to restore the brokenness of the human family. The ministry of reconciliation is to build bridges and tear down fences. It is to, to create and to restore human community, humane community. I think we find ourselves these days living in a contentious society in which we are taught to be suspicious of other people, especially those who may look or seem different from us, to be wary of those who may choose to do us harm, that we ought to be determined to protect, protect ourselves from those who could hurt us, and who knows who they might be. You know that bumper sticker, I don't get mad, I just get even? I would suggest they got up mad that morning. They are mad, and you better not cut them off. And there are other telling slogans of our society. Don't tread on me. Don't mess with Texas. I like that one. The assumption is this world is a tough world. It's everyone for oneself. Better to build walls around ourselves than to risk having entrances where people could come in. Or maybe you could go out. Better to be safe than sorry. Lock your doors. Look over your shoulders. Walk quickly on the other side of the street. Be prudent. Be wise. Don't be stupid. Norman Rockwell is one of our, my favorite artists. He captured an alternative view of American society at its best. You remember some of the pictures? People sitting out on the front porch, greeting folks who are walking by on the street. A policeman and a young boy sitting on a stool at a soda fountain. 
families gathered around a table sharing a meal together. Some old folks and some young folks with kind of secondhand instruments sitting in the, in the living room making music together. Seems kind of old, doesn't it? Some of old fashioned. Now, we have learned how to trip the garage door opener as we're approaching the driveway so the door is fully up just as we get to it. And before we leave the car, we hit the button again so the door comes down and we can retreat from the garage into the back of the house and never see a neighbor, never even talk to a neighbor, never have a neighbor interrupt our lives. And yes, there are some scary people out there. I think we have to be prudent about that. There are some who prey on others, P-R-E-Y, prey on others. Sometimes even a family member may need to be watched and monitored, cannot be trusted for the sake of the vulnerable. And I know all that up here, but I grieve over the fractured nature of our families and our society, even our churches, certainly the world in which we live. And so Paul would say to us, we need a robust ministry of reconciliation. We need the mending and the knitting together of relationships of people who are alike and even those who are not alike. We need to be breaking down the walls of hostility and suspicion that keep us in separated and even warring camps. <coughs> but to do this, if we're gonna take the Jesus model, the Jesus model is very counterintuitive. I refer to the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, the one that uh, has become the hunting, happy hunting ground of all those who want to find something to uh, fixate on, whether about the end of the world or uh, some kind of sign about what's going to happen on the uh, leap day tomorrow or something or other. It's not a book that tells us how the world will end, and it's not a prophecy book for something that you want to fixate on today's world. The writer of Revelation was trying to encourage a beleaguered Christian community to withstand a gruesome time of persecution at the end of the first century under the Roman Emperor Domitian. That was the focus. Not today, the end of the first century. It was a pastoral letter, not a prophetic letter, a pastoral letter intended to provide hope for Christians whose faith is about to be tested in the face of organized hostility and persecution. And the bottom line in those 22 chapters of, Revel of Revelation is that God is going to win. The bottom line is that Rome doesn't win, God wins. There are these awful visions of monsters and beasts and dragons and things that are gonna happen to thousands of people, but God wins. That's what Revelation says. God wins, count on it. But this is not a military victory. God, through Jesus, who is the lamb, not the lion, the lamb, doesn't line up tanks and planes and artillery, but God will win through love and through reconciliation by absorbing the worst that Rome can do. Threatened Christians are told not to engage in survival training or self-defense measures or building up their bodies or storing up munitions. Rather, in Revelation, they are told to remember the self-giving love of God seen in Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God who gives one's life, is martyred for the salvation of all. 
You see, that's the template for this ministry of reconciliation. It's to build up our ability, our willingness to love. It's to hone our capacity to forgive and maybe even forget. It's to train ourselves to reach out to the other, to speak words of healing, not of harm, in the choices we have, in the speech we give day by day. Support opportunities to do good, and when you have an opportunity to do good, do good. Find a place to bury old hurts and bury them. Walk away. Accept the fact that those about us are flawed expressions of the children of God, just as we are, and cut them some slack. It's a tough world. They may be having a tough day. Find a bridge that is broken and rebuild it for the sake of those on both sides of the broken bridge. Make sure your door is open and your heart is open so the estranged one if willing, might come back. Perhaps the best biblical picture of reconciliation is in the 15th chapter of Luke's Gospel. It's the parable of the lost son, as it usually is, but I think more appropriately, appropriately it's the parable of the lost sons. First, there's the willful son, the youngest son, who wants to cut ties, get his part of the family money, and leave home. Tired of dad and dad's expectations. And he goes off to find the world. He finds the world to be a pretty tough place. It's a place to learn life, but a tough place. There's the grieving father heart sick over the fractured family, day after day looks down the road, hoping that will be the day the son will come back. Day after day is disappointed, but one day the son is coming back. And they had this big feast this joy for the lost has been found. The family is back together again. Rejoice. And then there's that elder son, the one that stayed home, the one who was faithful to dad, not willing to forgive or forget, no reconciliation yet, wanting punishment for the one who has gone away broken the family. But you see, reconciliation is grace. Reconciliation is the best of all possible outcomes. And we could say that reconciliation is the purpose for our being here. It's our destiny as followers of Jesus. If God's agenda in Jesus Christ is reconciliation, then friends, our agenda can't be anything less. It's what we're called to do. Being vulnerable, yes. Might even be costly. Healing the human family. Wherever you are, whatever opportunities may be in front of you. Rejoice and be of good courage. God's counting on each of us. Amen.